Well, hello, how are you? This is the presentation for the Oklahoma Library Annual Conference 2021. And this presentation, what it is, it deals with the ADA and libraries, but it has a different perspective. And we have three speakers that are gonna be with us today. So let me go ahead and share my screen so we can meet the speakers really quick. So just give me a second so I can do that. And then what this presentation is, it really covers 30 years of the ADA and libraries. And it's an overview of the history. We talk about the compliance, but we talk about other, other things as well. And with this, we have three speakers, myself, Nelson Dent, with the Pioneer Library System. And then we have Jack McMahon. He is the ADA coordinator for Oklahoma. And then we also have Farrah Taylor. She is with the Oklahoma Department of Libraries. We each are gonna take certain sections of this tutorial training presentation. And we're gonna talk about the various aspects of the ADA and libraries and what all libraries need to know. Well, I'm going to go ahead and go first, and I'm really going to talk about the ADA. I want to give you some background of the ADA, and then I have a 12-point guide for all libraries, kind of 12-point compliance areas that everybody needs to know. My name's Nelson. Again, I'm with the Pioneer Library System. I'm also with the City of Norman ADA Advisory Board. I was born with Usher's syndrome type two. So many of you will probably know or not know I wear cochlear implants, but I also have tunnel vision and nighttime blindness. So you might see me with a white cane at conferences or around town and so forth. I've been with the Pioneer Library System for 20 years and also I'm an ADA advocate. Uh, really getting into the ADA and libraries and what we can do and things about what we need to think about. So today I want to cover what is the ADA? What are the 12 compliance areas for libraries? I'm going to use some of the resources from the ADA, which is ada.gov. Also, I pulled some of my resources from the Southwest ADA Center of Houston, Texas the American Library Association, and then of course, I pulled some resources from the Oklahoma Department of Libraries. We're gonna cover all of these areas with this presentation. Before we do get started, I do wanna talk about a legal disclaimer. Now this presentation is just a guide. It's not legal advice. We're not lawyers. However, we are gonna cover a little bit of the law, regulations, and guidelines, things that all libraries need to know. First of all, disability defined. If an individual with a disability is someone with a, a mental or physical impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity, or someone with a record of such impairment, or someone regarded as having such an impairment, not every disability is visible. You also have a variety of disabilities. You have the physical, mobility, strength, dexterity, stamina. You have sensory, vision, hearing, speech. You have non-obvious disabilities. You have intellectual, cognitive, psychiatric, learning. You have health conditions, cancer, diabetes. Also, let's remember you have COVID long haulers. You have all kinds of disabilities that you can see and not see. Not every disability is visible. So you have the American Disabilities Act, the United States Department of Justice, and it's under the Civil Rights Division. The American Disabilities Act, the ADA, was signed into law July 26, 1990. And that was done by President George H.W. Bush. I was near D.C. at the time when this took place, and it took place right outside of the White House. You see him right there signing it. So with that, 
The American Disabilities Act is one of America's most comprehensive pieces of civil rights legislation, and it prohibits discrimination and guarantees people with disabilities that have the same opportunities as everyone else to participate in the mainstream American life to enjoy employment opportunities, purchase goods, services, to participate in state and local government programs and services. So, the American Disabilities Act, it was modeled under the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Now that prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. You also have Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, ADA is part of that as well, the Equal Opportunity Law for people with disabilities. No qualified individual with a disability shall, by reason of such disability, be excluded from participation in or be denied in the benefits of services, programs, activities of a public entity or be subjected to discrimination by any such entity. Jack is going to cover that in the next section. So we have overarching requirements with national laws that cover this. Who has rights under the ADA? That applies to people who have a disability, a record of or regarded as having a disability have an association with a person with a disability. What is a disability? A physical or a mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity. So with that, you have the five titles of the ADA. Now in the ADA world, they kind of say it's only four titles and the fifth one is just miscellaneous. For our purposes of this session, we'll just look at the five really fast. We're definitely going to look at two of them. Title I covers employment. Title II covers public entities and then public transportation. Title III covers public accommodations and commercial facilities. Title IV covers telecommunication. Title V adds in other provisions. Notice I really put in bold Title II, Title III, public entities, public accommodations. So Title II, public entities, any state or local government entity, any department agency, instrumentality, uh, the special purpose district of a state or local government, your library building. You have community authorities too, but right here we're looking at libraries. Title III, public entity. Many libraries operate under the Title III entity. Title III entity operating within a city building, Title II. But often nonprofit libraries will lease facilities from their respective city. So you're looking at Title II and Title III, just things to be aware of. So the importance of the ADA in libraries, libraries have been and continue to be champions for access. The US Census Bureau suggests 54.4 million Americans have some type of disability. Note, 2020, we did the US Census. Due to COVID, they had pushed back the census release of that information. So we should get a lot of it in the fall of this year. At the time of this recording, it's spring 2021. So sometime late summer in the fall, look for that number 54.4 million and it's gonna go up. 1897, the Library of Congress opened up the reading room for the blind. The 20s and the 30s, libraries formalized and expanded services to patrons with disabilities. 1961, ALA crafted a series of standards for equal access, including people with disabilities. 1990, the ADA and libraries were already on the forefront for making libraries accessible for all. 
So today, libraries continue to lead and innovate in working with persons with disabilities. Public libraries, building accessible maker spaces for people with disabilities, academic libraries are developing inclusive online resources, special libraries are continuing to find new online venues to distribute material in alternate formats. So you have professional organizations that are building new means of advocating for people with disabilities. Now, the 12 basic requirements for ADA compliance at your library. I pulled this from accessadvocates.com. And I think this is just a neat website that really explains 12 basic steps that your library really needs to be aware of to be ADA accessible. But then with this presentation with Jack and Farrah, we're going to expand on that. One is your parking. If there's less than 25 parking spaces, there needs to be one handicapped space that's van accessible. That means the space should be eight feet wide and have an aisle eight feet wide. So it's got to be level, needs to be signage, and the curb cut should be right close to the entrance. If the library has more than 25 parking spaces, but less than 50, it needs another handicapped space even though they can share the same aisle. So for larger parking lots, one additional handicap space for every 25. Two, signage. Obviously, signs should be large and clear. You should be able to read all the signs. The print on the sign should be adequate in size and contrast so everybody can see it. Requirements are the same for the sign inside the building, and they need to show where the restrooms are, that they're accessible. Direction to the elevators, for example. Stairs, desks, exits, meeting rooms, special collections. You've got to think about signage. Three, pathways and doors, especially your main entrance. It should be smooth with a hard surface with no barriers should be 36 inches wide and have a safe, adequate ramp. Door opening should be 36, 36 inches wide and easily open, but it shouldn't have anything on the threshold that's more than one fourth of an inch. You gotta be able to get through. You need to think about your book returns. Inside the library, pathways should be clear as well. 32 inches wide, 60 inches wide, so wheelchairs can pass each other. You also need to think about your elevators and your stairs. Is there more one level in your library? If there is, you need an accessible elevator. The stairs, 36 inches wide, and then handrail all the way. The steps should be non-slip and not more than 11 inches. You need to think about the floors in the library. It shouldn't be bumpy, there should be no debris, it should be clear, no obstacles in the way. It should be flat and smooth. Also, it should have loud colors that disrupt the balance of somebody navigating through the library because you have to think about number six, which is lighting. It should be strong and uniform, try to make it glare free. You have to think the vision impaired, not everybody is totally blind. 90% of the people are vision impaired. It's 10% that are totally blind. So you have to think about vision impairment and lighting. You also need to think about your public access catalog, your computer station. So the computer station should have at least 36 inches of clear space that's around them. So you have a seating level if there's less than three of them. Now, larger libraries, you can mix that. You need to think about the furniture. Should be 40 inches of clear space between the furniture and the library and the tables. Should be 27 inches high, 19 inches of depth underneath. So people in wheelchairs can fit at the tables. You need to think about your periodicals and your stacks. The top row section of your periodicals shouldn't be higher than 48 inches. If it is, 
you need a sign indicating that they can ask for assistance so they can reach higher materials. But in the stack areas, the aisles, again, 36 inches of clearance, 42 inches is really preferred. 10, your checkout. You got to think about your checkout counter. Shouldn't be higher than more than 36 inches and at least 36 inches long. Look at your reference desk and your help desk. That counter and that help desk shouldn't be too high. So someone with a wheelchair or in the library, they need to make accommodation. So like having a section of the counter that's accessible for wheelchair, maybe at a table right next to them. So you can accommodate people with disabilities. Number 12, restrooms. There should be no barrier to the restroom and the doorways should be 36 inches wide so you have access. The stalls should be five by five feet to allow movement in a wheelchair. Grab bars should also be installed. Fixtures should be no higher than 48 inches. Sink handles should be push tight or motion sensor activated. Something else you might have noticed with the closed captioning and Zoom, especially what's going to happen this fall. Zoom announced there's going to have a functionality with all their Zoom business accounts. And you can tell below in this screen is live uh, closed captioning, and it's capturing everything that we say. If you do speak slowly and distinctly and loud, it'll capture up to 85, 90% of the presentation. So these settings should be available to everybody for the fall of 2021. And I saved you the link for that, and they'll talk more of that later on this year, especially this fall. Also, at the end here on my presentation, the American Libraries Magazine, the spring edition of March and April, really discussed the pandemic and the unequal impact on people with accessibility needs. So what ADA did and ALA, they got together and the American Library Association put together a really nice articles, one of the main articles in the issue, and it really talks about accessibility needs, connection and services that can't be replicated with virtual programming. So it really gives us some really good ideas on how to handle certain things and accommodation. So next up, I'm gonna pass the baton over to Jack McMahon. And Jack McMahon is our second presenter and he is a certified ADA coordinator and he's the president of Crossing the Chasm LLC. And that's an accessibility management consulting firm. And that's where he specializes in helping municipal and private facility owners, managers that evaluate, design, and manage effective accessibility solutions. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my side. And as I continue with his biography, he's gonna pull up on his end, his presentation. So Jack is also the Chief Operations Officer of New View, Oklahoma. So New View is an Oklahoma nonprofit company that specializes in helping the blind and the vision impaired individuals achieve their maximum potential. Jack is motivated by a bicycle accident and you know, left him paralyzed and he became an expert in accessibility where his specialties are program access and accessibility in outdoor environments. So, he developed experience by working with the National Park Service. And then he worked with the National Center of Disabilities and the Smithsonian. So he's given presentation to the American Institute of Architects, the Oklahoma chapter of the Institute of Architects, the University of Oklahoma Price Business College, uh, Oklahoma Parks and Recreation, the American Society of Landscape Architects, the Oklahoma Museum Association, his consulting projects include the city of Norman, Google, the Philmont Art Museum and Gardens, the Oklahoma Science Museum, Factory Obscure Museum, Telluride Ski and Golf Company, and many others. Now, Jack has a holistic approach based on two decades of 
personal experience and technical study. So while facility owners and managers and architects and planners, they can limit their interpretations of the ADA solely to the parameters of physical access. Now, Jack understands that compliance, which I just mentioned earlier, that's with the spirit of accessibility. So those laws really call for a broader understanding of needs with people with mobility, sensory, and cognitive disability, coupled with the application of a variety of tools, techniques, and management practice to build solutions that last. So Jack, I'm gonna let you take over this part and tell us what you got. Thank you very much, Nelson. That was a very generous introduction. Welcome everyone. I'm gonna approach the, the discussion of ADA slightly differently. The ADA itself is a phenomenal set of law and civil rights issues, but reviewing the ADA is very complex. They are very, very onerous, but there are an awful lot of misunderstandings too. So what do you need to have? What, do you, what is your walk away that's most important from my perspective? And that is the sentence you're seeing right in front of you right now. Uh, the words, an equal opportunity to participate in and enjoy the benefits of resonate throughout the civil right, not only the ADA, but almost all civil rights act that exist in America today. So what I'd like to do is try to break down these components uh, and actually examine what these words mean, and then, then give you some examples of how I would apply them in a library environment. So an equal opportunity, uh, what might that mean? Um, uh, it has several different meanings, but what it means specifically is that all people uh, are, are effective. All people should be able to access and enjoy the benefits of an organization or operation, uh, and they ought to be able to do it together. It is not accessible in the civil rights law to have an environment where it says, these people who are able-bodied can go in this line, and these people who are disabled have to go in that line, or displays are separate, or uh, environments are separate. It, it, to the degree that is reasonably possible, and those words are important, the environment ought to be integrated so that all people can come together. Not only that, but it in, introduces the, the environment that affect all areas of, of disability as, as Nelson reviewed. So mobility, sensory, and cognitive disability people ought to be able to participate equally. They, have, they ought to have an equal opportunity to enjoy the experience. And I use that word very deliberately, not a lot of other ADA ex experts use the word experience, but after all, the reason we go to a library, the reason, the reason we come to your specific library is not because the ramps are a certain degree of slope or that the doors are a certain wide. That's how we get to your library. We come to your library to do stuff, to, to enjoy the benefit of the library. And I'll get into that in a moment, but it's all about the experience. So what we're talking about is an equal opportunity to have an equivalent experience. That doesn't mean that the experience always have to be exactly the same. When you accommodate someone in an experience, that could be a very unique experience, but it's meant to be the equivalent of that experience. And I'll give you some examples of that in a moment. So to participate in actually means two different things. First of all, it means the ability to get in and enjoy the, the, the physical structure. So getting in the doors, the parking areas, the restrooms, the actual rooms themselves are physical structures and they are referred to in the ADA um, as architectural barriers. The removal of architectural barriers is the primary scope. And this is really what most people know about the ADA or how most people think about the ADA. But again, people don't come to your library to enjoy the physical structure, they come to enjoy the experience. And experiences is, is, is a pseudo name for programs. And the ADA also requires that programs be made accessible. So programs, activities, and services alike in your library are subject to the ADA just as much as physical access is. Here's an example. Let's assume for a moment that this young lady is deaf 
Um, the physical barrier has been accommodated in the sense that her table is high enough. As, as Nelson said, it's at least 27 inches off the floor, off the clear floor space. It's got enough tow room so that this lady can slide her old chair under the table to be able to participate in the seating area. And she has a helper or guide who could actually help translate, write notes, uh, provide transcript, transcripts of lesson notes for her if she cannot hear it or see it or reach it. So this is an example of what the environment might look like in an integrated setting. Some other examples, uh, this is a library I reviewed quite recently. Um, one of the services, one of the programs in this particular library is lending laptop computers. And you go to this kiosk, you swipe your library card, you can reach in, grab the computer, take it with you. When you check out, uh, you put it back in the machine and it records on your library card. The, the problem with this particular machine is under the ADA, the barrier, the physical barrier says that you have to be able to perform the function with a closed fist. You don't have uh, any responsibilities for twisting, pinching, or turning with your, with your hand. And this, this particular machine is not available for, for that. I can't, for example, because I can't use my hands very well, I can't reach in here and grab one of these computers. Now, the accommodation for this would be a sign next to this particular um, program that would say that if you need help receiving that computer, please contact um, somebody at the service desk. That would be an accommodation that would fairly make this program accessible. Here's another one. And that is more and more libraries are developing place, place stations uh, for kids with, um, that are accompanying parents or friends in the library. But most play stations today are developed for kids to play on the floor. So as you see here, all of the play elements in this particular play area are elements that, that kids could play with beginning on the floor or on the floor. The problem with that is, what does a person in a wheelchair do if they actually can't reach these elements on the floor? So an accommodation here would be to actually have a table in here where games and blocks could be played with just as much as, as a child might play with them on the floor. Lastly, the words enjoy the benefits of, well, that is really, really important because we're talking about programs again, programs uh, are what you go to the library to participate in, uh, and we have to make the, those available to be able to enjoy the benefits of them. So what do we mean by that? What do I mean specifically is that you have to be able to do it, see it, hear it, or understand it. When the program exists, whatever that program might be, these are the four elements that really apply to that specific program. How you do it um, varies. This is a common list, list of programs that might occur in your library. It's the reason why we go to your library and it's the stuff we do when we get there. These are the programs that may, need to be made accessible. And in many ways, it's common sense to make it accessible. There aren't any specific rules or specific guidelines of how you do it. Uh, the, the ADA solely says that you have the responsibility to do it how you do it depends on your best judgment and common practice guidelines that are widely uh, published, your library association, uh, other organizations like the Smithsonian, which have really, really wonderful guidelines uh, for how you make programs accessible. One of the ways that you do approach uh, making programs accessible is using alternate format. If a person can't see something, there are a lot of ways that you can give them an equivalent experience. Audio description, for example. If a person can't see um, the actual uh, screen in a video, there may be an audio description that actually describes the scene, each individual scene that's going on, in addition to uh, the audio that's also going on in the video. A personal guide is another example of an alternate format. If a, if a person can't easily navigate through the library, a personal guide could help them, which is in a version or a, a version of an accommodation. 
For a person who's deaf or hard of hearing, there could be something as simple as passing notes back and forth to the individual or uh, computer assisted real time text if they're in a video room or a conference room. So there's a large screen, there's a person who's interpreting uh, the actual voice of the person speaking, and they're typing it in a text message that goes to the screen for the person who's deaf or hard of hearing to be able to read. For cognitive disabilities, um, a reasonable accommodation would be making things in logical transitions, make sense, easy to understand, uh, make them uh, available in, in pictorial form where, where possible, uh, because that's the way a person actually engages anyway. From a mobility standpoint, making something reachable, uh, making something at a proper height, making providing a personal assistance of a guide, if a person needs help actually navigating is also an alternate format. The second ma major area of Title II and Title III, as Nelson said in the, in the ADA, is the requirement that you bear to provide effective communication. Not only is the program from the, uh, from the activity required to be accessible, so is the communication that goes with it. Um, I think Nelson gave a lot of examples here, the signs, the marquees, uh, the handouts you might provide, uh, the posted directions throughout the library. These have to be made accessible. If a person can't read them or can't see them because they're positioned uh, too high on a door or too high on a wall, then the reasonable accommodation would be to assist that individual when requested. The same thing is true in, in a lecture hall. If a person is deaf or hard of hearing, obviously they can't hear the lecture or uh, the musical piece being played. So there's got to be an accommodation for helping that individual understand or experience uh, the audible sensation of the going on in that room. It may be a handout describing the sound or describing uh, what the element might be or the purpose of it. For cognitive or developmental, uh, the requirement may be that, that that experience be made accessible because it's been made simpler, shorter sentences, shorter paragraphs, easier to understand words, logical and lighting all have a significant bearing in making those communication elements accessible. Lastly, and this is very, very important, this is occurring at libraries, school systems, uh, all around the country, is electronic communication also needs to be made accessible. So things like your website, fillable apps so, so that they can reserve rooms or spaces, PDFs that you might be suspending on your, on your library website also need to be made accessible. So these are things that are dramatically changing in the world of program access today. The smartphone has been revolutionary in its impact on accessibility. There are significant number of apps, guides, listening devices that are available on almost every uh, smartphone today. Uh, there are tremendous amount of improvements that are available. And most people who are blind or visually impaired or deaf or hard of hearing know the various applications that exist on these phones. It is absolutely amazing. However, you can't assume that a person has these apps. So you've got to be ready at the library to provide an accommodation, to know what that accommodation, uh, accommodation might be, and your staff trained to recognize or look out for the individual who may not be able to see your hearing and be able to offer assistance. I, I talked about your website. I'd like to talk about it a little bit more uh, because this is very dramatic in, in the world of accommodation today. Um, the website, as you know it, is an expression of several things. It really defines why you exist, uh, what you specifically, uh, uh, your expertise is, your unique, your, your unique purpose. It also provides your policies, your rules, your regulations, the way you operate and govern your library. And lastly, it's an extension of your smile. Every one of you want to invite all of the guests that you can into your library. So it's an extension of welcome. Well, a person with a disability is just as concerned about being welcomed as well as anybody else. And so they've got unique questions also. 
the person with a disability looking at your library and specifically looking at your library's website is asking many of the same questions your, your customers ask, except this last point here, and that is what barriers might exist that are gonna make it difficult for me to come visit you? And the barriers don't literally have to be uh, spelled out, but in general terms, what are the architectural barriers? What are the program barriers? What are the communication barriers that exist in your library? It doesn't disqualify you. It doesn't go against you. It's just simply your visitor is, is asking of you through your website. The answers to that really are an expression of whether or not I, as a person with a disability, am really welcomed at your library. To kind of get an idea of what that might look like, I can tell you that on a website, the information about how your website is inviting to a person with a disability should normally occur within three clicks of the landing page of that website. So if I can go to a web website and show you, um, it ought to be available in three clicks. So I went to Arkansas to kind of get an example of whether a large uh, library in Arkansas might be available under three clicks. This is the library webpage or the landing page of the Bentonville Public Library. So I looked at this menu bar to find out where would I go if I were gonna look for accessibility information. And it's a little bit confusing, but for me, I would probably go to the About Us section, um, which is very, very logical. But once I got there, I have this long menu of items, which are pretty confusing to me because I don't see clearly where the information might be about accessibility. So I'm confused. Uh, I've already expended two clicks. I'm looking for a third click. I actually went to Facility Amenities. It wasn't there. So what I found was information under the category called policies. When I clicked on that, what I got was this statement. This is the extent of information relative to accessibility at this particular library. So the top line ex expresses uh, this library's concern, and that is that the library uh, will recognize my unique independence and protect me from public scrutiny. It really doesn't tell me, again, what I can do. It says that you'll protect me from public scrutiny. People aren't gonna be staring at me, um, but what can I do? What will I be able to read? What will I be able to listen to? How will I be able to maneuver? How can I even get in or park at your library with this amount of information? The reality is I can't. And that's the extent of accessibility on this particular um, uh, library's website. So to compare that, I then went to Oklahoma City Public Library System, and this is the landing page there. Now, once again, if I want to find something about accessibility here, uh, it might be, I would hope it's gonna be within three clicks. If I go here and I go to the, the Discover tab, which makes sense to me in terms of where I could go to find information about accessibility, in fact, I do find it. So I've hit two clicks. I, I'm about to hit the third click and I'm already much richer, much easier, much simpler to gather information. But what am I gonna find there? Well, I find first of all, a, a, a page of information that says we welcome you into the library system and we're gonna provide services to everybody who's here, regardless of your ability. It, to reinforce that fact, the remainder of this page actually has a uh, category by category of what you're doing for me and other people for disabilities. For example, there's a whole section here on building accessibility. Similarly, there's a whole section on interpreted services. So things like sign language interpreters, the information about one is, if one is available, what notices I have to give are provided into that section. And the same thing is true with the assistive listening system. If I'm deaf or hard of hearing, how can I use the, the, the audible communication features in your library? So I clicked on one of these. I clicked on the building accessibility. And once again, it tells me exactly what's available for me, how far away parking is, uh, whether or not there is public parking, additional public parking nearby. And most importantly, at the bottom of this page, is that the library is providing other resources that I might need. So this is 
probably the best website I've ever seen in terms of accessibility or an example of how to make a website in an environment welcoming for, for visitors. So I'm telling all of this to you and you might be saying, well, who said this? I mean, where are the rules? Who gives the standards and guidelines? Well, from a, a barrier standpoint, an architectural barrier standpoint, it's pretty straightforward. There is a manual that is called the ADA Accessibility Guidelines. It's published online. It's also hard copy. It's about 700 pages long. It's copious diagrams with details and measurements to really define exactly what the accessibility guidelines for physical barriers. In terms of program access guidelines, however, there's not a lot of published information and the interpretation of what an accessible program is, is very subjective. It depends on your best judgment. Now, if I were you, I would refer strongly to publish best practices throughout the industry. I would go in and Google program access guidelines for libraries to find out what other libraries do and what other libraries associations do to provide program access standards. Lastly, how about effective communication? Where do I go for that information? Once again, the guidelines are subjective. Uh, on, on a website to evaluate the accessibility of website and web content, there are best practices currently, WCAG website, um, accessibility guidelines, the latest version is 2.1 AA. These are published best practices guidelines. They're not necessarily adopted yet or codified into law. So there are some resources. Uh, a lot of the interpretation and solutions is up to you to define. Um, now, who is responsible? I think Nelson opened the door on this one. Um, if your library is owned by the city, for example, or another uh, private entity, most of the physical assets you've got, the, bar the physical barriers in your library are the responsibility of the owner. So you can see that the list of these here. But I've seen lots of libraries and lots of other uh, businesses sit, rely on the fact that the programs can't be modified or shouldn't be modified because the physical structure is owned by the owner and his responsibility is to help people get in the door before they even get to your program. That's not true. The, it, you have, you bear the responsibility of making programs accessible no matter what, even if you have to make that program available in an alternate format at a, a different location or in another form. So there is an onerous requirement on the, on the lessee, on you, if you're, if you're a, a Title II or Title III entity who's leasing your property. The programs um, that are common that you are required for making accessible, they, they are not the owner's requirements are listed here. Um, so children's activities is a really, really big one. Information help desks, how you help people uh, get books, check out books, um, sort and look for books is all on you. It's, it hasn't had anything to do with the owner, even if there are barriers to getting into your, your building. Effective communication is on you as well. Your website, uh, any software you might be using, uh, the, the videos, the audible uh, programs that you've got in various conference rooms, those are your requirement to be made accessible. Gray areas also exist. Uh, auxiliary services in the form of things like vending machines. Lots of time you'll have a special event or an attraction to, to welcome a crowd on a certain evening or a certain day. Um, those vending machines are on the owner's property possibly, but still the, the responsibility for making the vending machine or a food truck accessible is, is great. It probably is your responsibility, but it could be the owner's responsibility. The only way for sure to know is actually negotiate well-defined documents with your owner. Um, in summary, I'd, li I'd like to re reiterate those words that I think are absolutely essential and at the core of the ADA, and that is providing an equal opportunity to participate in and enjoy the benefits of. And typically, if you remember that sentence, you can't go wrong with most of your accessibility uh, requirements. 
um, architectural and program solutions are required, as is effective communication. So those are the three things that I would ask you to walk away from this presentation and remember. With that, I'll turn the turn the slideshow back over to Nelson, and he can hand the baton to Farah. Well, next up, we have Farah Taylor, and she is the Public Information Officer at the Oklahoma Department of Libraries. And as I do this uh, brief bio, she's going to click in with her screen, and she manages online media, website, and social media for ODL. Previously, she worked at the Department of Disabilities Council of Oklahoma as the Public Education Officer. She's a graduate of the University of Oklahoma Gaylord College of Journalism and Mass Communication. She served as Vice President and the Board of Directors of the Down Syndrome Association of Central Oklahoma and co-chaired the annual Buddy Walk. She's advocated in Washington, D.C. for the Buddy Walk. She also volunteered at OKAIM OK and the Youth Leadership Forum. She's a graduate of the Partners in Policy Making program, and she's got two children, ages 11 and 14. And Farah, what do you got? Hi, thank you, Nelson. Um, are you seeing my PowerPoint screen right now? Yes. Okay, just making sure. Um, thank you. Um, so we've learned several ADA resources and ideas, and I'm just going to quickly cover a few general resources that you can find online that may assist you and welcome your patrons into your library. Um, I'm going to switch to a website now real quick. Um, are you seeing our website? Yes. Okay. So I'm not seeing the little frame around my <laughs> screen. Okay. Um, so I, I was going to take you on a quick tour of some resources that we have on our website. And if you go to our main website under libraries at ok.gov and you scroll down under features, um, I have put some disability resources here that have been compiled by uh, myself and again, Jen from the uh, Disabilities Council of Oklahoma. Um, we had previously put on workshops involving some of these resources. So I'm gonna point out a few that I feel like would be beneficial to you and your patrons. I'm gonna start out here um, with some of the resources that I think would be beneficial. Uh, if you, if, if someone comes in with disability related questions, um, first and probably most all encompassing, the Developmental Disabilities Council of Oklahoma and the Center for Learning and Leadership have information booklets that you can access and print um, from this page. You can request copies from the Center for Learning and Leadership to have them at your library. Um, they are, they include programs and services that can be helpful across the lifespan from disability communities and family support to education and childcare, employment training, health and wellness, and so on. Um, some other beneficial resources for patrons uh, include family and peer support. Like if you scroll down, there's the Oklahoma Family Network. This is beneficial for new and expecting parents looking for somewhere to turn for guidance. Uh, they can connect with a mentor family who have experienced similar circumstances uh, and get advice. Um, now let's look at a tool that is useful. Um, when going into a new classroom, daycare, hospital, or other support environment, um, the one pager, it is a quick breakdown of things you need to know about a person in a simple one page format. Uh, it's basic layout shows what people like about the person, what is important to the person, and how best to support the person. I've used it and updated it for my son's teachers for many years. And a couple of teachers said that the one pager was so useful to them that they started giving the templates to all their new students at the beginning of the year. Uh, then they can instantly get to know more about them and how best to support them in the classroom. And this can be used for several um, environments. One of my friends used it when she went into the hospital 
And when she woke up from surgery, everybody um, that was helping her in the hospital knew exactly, you know, that she wanted three blankets instead of two or, you know, just little bits of advice. Um, if you have questions about some of these resources, feel free to reach out to me. Um, if I don't know the answer, I can help you find somebody that will. Um, there's a few more links to tools that might be beneficial to review. Um, there's like the um, communication, communication with pictures. Um, there's the page fluffers and some other tools on here. Um, I'm going to look at resources that are going to be helpful to you and your library staff as customer service providers. Um, since we say, since what we say matters and how we refer to people matter, let's first look at people first language. You can download a PDF to learn and share. This provides information for how to talk or write, like in a press release about a person using people first language. It's always best to listen to the individual to find out what she or he prefers. And in most situations, you would simply use the person's name. But when it is necessary to use a disability identifier, using people first language is a good place to start. It always refers to the people, the person first instead of their uh, disability. Um, next, you will find this video called At Your Service. Um, it is a 20 minute video that uh, features national disability leaders offering insights, tips, and recommendations on how to provide exemplary customer service to individuals with disabilities. This will be good to uh, review and share with library staff um, or um, new staff coming on. Um, this um, is a very beneficial accessibility toolkit. Um, it was put together by the ASGCLA, which was previously part of the ALA. And this website has very useful um, pointers in serving all your customers. Like it has advice on interacting respectfully with children with learning disabilities, um, with service animals, um, autism spectrum disorders, assistive technology, dementia. If you review through some of these, you get um, good advice and tips. Um, and you can scroll through and there's different resources too. Speaking of service animals, let's see, the DDCO um, created this publication um, about knowing your rights and responsibilities as a person with a service animal and as a customer service provider. There is a booklet um, and poster for staff um, that would go in the staff area um, to learn more. And then there is a poster um, for the public um, to display, um, and all of these can be downloaded here and printed. Um, now let's move on to web and technology accessibility. Not only do we want our physical library space to be accessible um, and welcoming, we want our online presence, apps, and other technologies to be as well. And to help make your library website more accessible to all, I recommend having a look at the WAVE tool. Uh, it is valuable for anybody that works on a website or a web page. Um, you can download the Chrome extension, um, which links here, and Firefox. And then when you pull up any web page in your browser, you would just click on the W in the top right corner, and it will give you a breakdown of the web accessibility issues and advice on how to fix them. And you can point out, and it will give you a reference and advice on how to fix different parts of your website. Um, going along with website accessibility, I wanna point out the tech access conferences. Um, these are organized by AbleTech and they are free conferences and they're held every year. Uh, local and national speakers share ways to make websites and other technologies more accessible. Uh, AbleTech also offers free or low cost workshops throughout the year as well. Like one of them was on how to make your PDFs more accessible. Um, 
Able Tech is a good resource um, for training and questions related to accessibility. Um, you can contact them on getting on their email list to find out when more workshops and conferences are being held. And we can also share it from our ODL um, email list too. Um, we talked a little bit about Zoom accessibility. Able Tech, Oklahoma Works, and DRS put together this guide of six helpful tips on making tips, making your next meeting or webinar more accessible, like how to turn on closed captioning, um, describing your visuals, and, and different things like that. So that is a good resource when you're working on, on your meetings or webinars. Um, then below that, I have added some of the ADA resources that Nelson and Jack mentioned during this presentation. Um, and so we will have these posted so you can review them. Sorry, let's go back to the presentation. Here is the web the URL. And if you would like to bookmark this website um, or this web page, um, and look through some of the resources that we have put together there. Um, I know that's a lot of resources wrapped into a few minutes, um, but be sure and check out the website. Um, we wanna thank you to, for joining us and dedicating your time to learn more about the ADA and how libraries efforts can help provide a more welcoming environment for people of all abilities. Um, here is uh, Nelson and Jack and and my contact information. Be sure to reach out if you have any questions or need more information. Uh, we want to thank OLA for allowing us to present uh, on this topic and thank you for being here. <laughs>